Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Writers Drinking Whiskey, your literary happy hour, place where you find the next author you're going to love and where we contemplate our metaphysical insignificance. I'm your host, your belligerent barkeep who always overserves, William R. Hensey, and I am delighted today, honored to have John Mac McElroy with me. Mac, welcome to the Whiskey Bar. Well, I'm glad to be here. I think this is my first literary happy hour. This is great stuff. <laughs> I, I have no idea what's going to happen, but it's great. Yeah, I, no one does. That's no one does. literary happy hour. It's, it's, it's live Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so I'll give you the introduction and feel free to jump in and, and fill in anything I miss. But um, so of your writing accomplishments here, we have the short story collection, Whatever Happens Probably Will, which I have my copy here. I mentioned the uh, Mac pre-show. I forget to have him sign my copy, but I have the unsigned you know, copy here. Um, and then you co-authored um, with some friends, if I remember the story right, was not exactly rocket scientists and other stories, which is the greatest title in the history of literature. But <laughs> I, I, just to interject, uh, and we probably won't focus on that tonight, but we just released the sequel to Not Exactly Rocket Scientists, and and in a burst of imagination, we've called it Not Exactly Rocket Scientists Two. The totally unnecessary sequel. I mean, <laughs> if you like the first one, you might like this one. Oh, very good, very good. <laughs> good to hear. Um, so, anything, um, anything I missed, writing wise, or just you want to add personal wise? Uh, you know, no. Let's see. It'll it'll probably all spill out anyway. All right. So, to my favorite part of the show. Okay. What are we drinking? Oh yeah. Well, okay. This is a <laughs> this is a two part, right? And I think I gave you a little bit of a heads up. What what I wanted to do was add a little local flavor. And uh, for those people, I'm down in I'm off the coast of the United States, a little island called Hill, and uh, we call it the Low Country. And uh, the other day we had some folks over from brunch, and I said, Moses. Bloody Marys. I wandered over to our local store, and they had this Bloody Mary mix that had the clams, clam juice, and Bloody Great. Never had one. So, it was a hit. It was so I planned to do just that, of course. <laughs> I think I called you this morning. I went over. The store was closed this week. So, what about you? I you know, what? I don't have. So, what I've done for you. Because I know you want a recipe, I'm going to read you at least a couple ways to do what I'm going to call the coastal low country Bloody Mary. I've already given the punchline. It has clam. clam. Mm -hmm. So basically, for those who want a, a little bite and a little spark in your brunch aisle, right, generally, that's writers drinking early kind of a thing, that brunch, <laughs> th 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 there's a complicated way. Do this, this, this drink, um, and it all has some kind of unanswered questions. So here goes, and I, I wrote it so I would get it. The fun way, come in a large pitcher. Blend your favorite vodka with something called the Charleston Bold and Spicy Bloody Mary mix, and it's three ounces of the mix to one ounce booze. Eh, give it. Now that's blended with Worcestershire sauce sea salt, celery seed, a couple of things I couldn't read. And the whole mix is online, and I think it can be bought at World Market. I have no financial favor. So you might want to add a little pinch of pepper. Then you pour in clam juice. Said clam juice in the difficult iteration is the clam juice that you have found by going out and privately harvesting clams on some shoreline. <laughs> then I guess you come home and you either milk the clam <laughs> for <laughs> or maybe you'd squeeze it. I, I don't know. That's that's a mystery. So I don't recommend that. If you can't get the, <laughs> don't go, don't go find don't, clams. All right. Don't milk clams. Don't milk clams or squeeze them. I mean, you know, we don't want to harm animals on the way to the Bloody Mary. Um, so another way to do it is 
The easy way is just uh, go get a pre-mixed Bloody Mary mix, right? And just add clam juice. And I found out, buy clams in a little can, and it comes with clam juice. So sure. you throw that in. <laughs> this is wonderful. Or alternatively, you can use Clamato juice, which has okay. clam. This, what a world. I love it. All right. So then, <laughs> I mean, it was so fabulous. Then you pour the delight over ice, you add a slice of lime, and here's the real fun. I don't even think about it. Oh, Go get a cup of juicy, cooked, and peeled shrimp, big ones. Hang them on the lip, on the lip of your Stir it all up, and then fasten your <laughs> so there it is. There it is. Well, all that was going to be great fun. And then I realized, you know, I don't know what time people will watch this, but it's 7 o'clock our time, and that's not bloody me. So I went to the old standby. One of your favorites, Mr. Maker and his mark. There it is. With a Very good. Ginger. So I salute you, Bill. Yeah, I Our salute you, too. I have Very some good, there sir. as well. Good that's a virtual, you. a Zoom virtual clink. <laughs> Yeah, I can assure you, um, this is the first one of the evening. Right, which is good news. Oh, very good. Um, and I'll be so anyone that's watched the show is going to realize if they pay any attention that I almost always have like two or three drinks going. I have the one I share with everyone, and then I have my like side yeah. whiskey. <laughs> okay, I love it. So, so the oh, makers and ginger ale is my side whiskey for today. Yeah, yeah. My main whiskey that I wanted to share with everyone is super simple. It's just a fun story. I'll grab it off the back of the bar here and let's see if I can I can see. So if we can see on there, so it's Glenn Levitt, but if you'll see the name right under the 15 years, it says Bill Hyensi. Oh. <laughs> so my uh, my last name, of course, doesn't have that Y right after the H, but my wife's does. My wife's last name is Hi. Oh. And I joked the whole time we were dating when we were engaged and things that when we got married, I wanted to just come like smash our names together. So so and would be high and C and it would be the super name, you know. I say all kinds of ridiculous things. My wife's never had any interest in any of them. You know? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> But she did, I think, make her Instagram knit handle or something, high NC. And so we had a friend that thought that was the last name. And so very thoughtfully got me this bottle, got the little customized label for it. Um, and I love it because it's the only time I'll ever get I'll ever get the super name. So that's a great story. <laughs> and I'm gonna drink it out of for no particular reason. I got these little wooden cups from the Renaissance Fair. Um, and it has, it's actually like Game of Thrones themed. It was Renaissance Fair, but I've actually found, we used to meet up with some friends um, during the pandemic um, when it was still a lot of restrictions. We'd meet them for lunch and then go out to a park. Um, and I had started taking these and I quite like drinking out of a wooden cup. Like it's really, it's a, it's a different experience, but I'm going to um, set my, uh, my Glenn Levitt out of this wooden cup. And then occasionally you'll you'll spot me with um you know my maker's mark and I actually I actually have this this Dan Conover's episode I had these glasses with it's actually ice right here ah. I have that set up just in case too so well, I'm, you're 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 kind of a triple threat over you're kind of a triple <laughs> threat over there I, man I'm just you know. All I got is a, a, a paper Bloody Mary and a, right. and a maker's mark. Right. Right. I mean, you, you oh. know, to host the show, I've got to, I got to keep my uh, my tolerance up or something. I'm not not sure what I'm doing. So um, I love to start, and you mentioned it. I love to start kind of by finding out where the where people are in the world, or spiritually, it could be metaphysically, who knows? But so you're in Hilton Head area, <laughs> South Carolina. What do you have to do if you visit Hilton Head? And where is the best spot for a drink? Hilton for those, it's the second largest barrier island in the country. The first being Long Island. In Long Island. Oh, really? Never uh, knew that. We're, we're, we're about, uh, well, I, I sometimes take facts up. So, you know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about that. I think we're about 14 miles long, about seven miles, you know, seven miles long. Anyway, so we're, we're, we're relatively chunky. Gorgeous beach. We really are. Fantastic. Right. 
we live build a new home on a tidal creek. And and so one of the things you've got to see down here is the marsh. And and uh, we take great pride in not doing what other places have done where they think the marsh is let's fill it in and you know and fill it. The marsh is really the key to the ecosystem. And uh we're just really blessed to live on a marsh. Don't see the ocean, that's where the rich people live. But <laughs> it's just fantastic. You need to do that. Um, and one of the great uh, places to do that, and my buddy's going to love this plug because I'm going to plug it. It's my absolute I had lunch here today is Hudson Seafood on the dock. Okay. And uh, it's, it's on uh, the Intracoastal Waterway, marshes, and then you see the boats winging their way from uh, New York to Florida. And uh, they've got great local beers. They've got the best oysters shrimp on the East Coast. There are three shrimp boats that dock at the dock, and you can watch them bring your shrimp for the Bloody Mary that I just oh, that is you gotta awesome. go. If you go, say hi to Andrew. Uh, that's a great place. Um, you know, I, I, I add any others would only do insult to the thirty or forty other great places, but. Sure. And, and that's where I go. And they got a fun little bar if you don't want to sit and have a have a lunch, although you should have those oysters. You can actually sit at the bar, which is right by uh, the shrimp boats. Very oh, cool. I, oh, I guess that's if you cool. got to the bar at five in the morning, you could watch the shrimp boats leave, but <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. Right. That, that's a that's a great recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. Key question here that I love to start writers off on. What really pisses you off? <laughs> I, and I know there's probably like a laundry list, but what's, uh, yeah, what's, um, what's the two or three you want to pick out here? Well, good. That's what I I, I kind of thought you might wing that question. So, you know, I spent the last week re reducing, you know, seven or eight thousand things. <laughs> I'm, I'm about 112 years old. I, I mean, and I'm cranky about everything. I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of happy, <laughs> fun guy on the one side. But back there somewhere is this is cranky old guy that's pissed off about you know a lot of things. So <laughs> I kind of people get it. on your grass, right? Well, no, 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 no. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, kind of a higher level, and I, I, I will say there's a there's a and I wish I could remember to say to I'm, I'm from New Jersey originally, born in Mississippi, and raised in New Jersey, and everyone in New Jersey you know knows a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy that gets something. <laughs> well, uh, uh, my Buddy on my first book, whose name is Buddy, his buddy uh, has a blog called The Cranky Old Man. And, and he, he, he sends out these bar, this long, just every day. <laughs> and anyway, so The Cranky Old Man, great. I've never met him, but he's great. So I'm, I'm a cranky old man. I get it. You know, I understand it. I love the guy. So, so I kind of figured out, you know, uh, I kind of a, uh, Referencing, and I won't get serious on that, kind of an earlier part of my life was uh, in, in law and, and politics, quite frankly. Um, I worked in the Senate, the US Senate back when it worked. <laughs> sure. Seriously, and there was stability and people on the left and the right. Buck, I could bore you fascinating stories. I went to a State of the Union and sat up there back when people didn't shout at the president. I mean, right. so stability. And and the desperation of the democratic political process by Syria side. Lawyers have an institutional connection and obligation to the process. And and when you see it challenged, and I'm not gonna name names to get into, but you know, we all look at it. And sure. uh, you know, it's so sad. My my granddaughter the other day was in high school was watching the State of the Union and she said they were like children, you know. Parts of it, and, right. and I, I had no answer, you know, and, and uh, other than I, I want to tell her that yeah, old Grandpa once sat up there, in the gallery, and it was a meaningful dialogue with American people. And, yeah, it, it, anyway, so yeah, that that that's upsetting. Uh, we live, as I said, on a tidal creek near the ocean on a barrier island. Um, so I'm not so happy with climate change. 
you know, come on, let's uh, open our eyes. Failing knees. That was a <laughs> minor shot. Um, and any any time I have to make a customer satisfaction, I mean, you know, come on. You know, yeah. Due to unusual delay, there's never unusual delays. There, the RQC fired one person. <laughs> Yeah, they're yeah, usual they're at this that. point. You yeah. need to know and the difference. Said, and I wish, I wish I'd say, you know, look, we got a long line, not due to a you. No, it's never not an unusual delay. I mean, come on, you know. Right. But but I'm going to really, really hone in. And this will engage us in conversation. And I, I, I'm really a technological idiot. But I'm going to I'm going to take for number three. I think the thing that's really, really annoying. Me Pretty much everything kind of along the techno, digital. Uh, I love the flip phone. After that, you know, everything has gone south. <laughs> and, and, you know, so two or three things. We're down here on an island that people you know, come to. Let's use Hudson's. I go there to lunch all the time. I'll see in the summer families of four or five people, presumably maybe from Ohio. Or, you know, they're on a, a beautiful intercultural water there. Boats, there's right? and all four or five of them, you know, the mom, the dad, and the kids, they pull out their cell phone. Right. I mean, I mean, the Chinese spy balloon, which <laughs> didn't crash too far from here, could have been crashing off the dock, and they'd be picking it up on, you know, five yeah. minutes later on the social. I mean, it just, it, it's an old, and, and it's just, it, it's an alien, alien kind of, uh, kind of world. So mm-hmm. I think that. A disassociation of community conversation to the device. I think it's just bad. I just sure. you know, this is me. And and here's the one that, that, that really goes. And I'd say fate grace on your shell. What what could be more annoying, potentially catastrophic than this new artificial intelligence device? <laughs> The chat GPT. GPT. I mean, where did this come from? And I've been sitting around here, and suddenly the world has changed. It's going to replace writing. And and, I mean, I I really believe it. Well, we're on our way. We're on our way. We're on our way to to dinosaurs. I finally (laughs) have something in my life, Bill. I love writing. And I'm I'm now going to be obsolete before I even, you know, pay the bills. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll believe it once I call into one of these, like, you know, when you call like your internet service and they have the, the robot operator come on and that that's actually probably above all, like I lose my shit with the robot operator. Like I can't like, I, I don't like, I, I probably have some accent. I don't think it's that bad though, that they literally can never understand me. Like it, it that thing just drives me crazy, but I'll, I'll believe the chat GPT stuff because it's all based on stuff that's made before it. So yeah. it's, it tops out. Like, so it might for some low level, like I know with coding, they're like, Oh, just low level coding. It does really well. But when you need that spark of creativity, that imagination, I don't believe it has that. And I also think everything gets oversold. Like Bitcoin was going to replace money. Right. And now it's like, Oh my God, Bitcoin's to the moon. Oh, now we're all broke again. Or what? There's that like, FTX <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Like everyone's broke with that. So, well, well, Bill, you won't be surprised that I got nowhere near Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no way. But I, I hope, I, I want to hold out hope. And I don't want to get too serious. I mean, come on. We're, sure. You know, absolutely. The pace of change, uh, I think, is almost, at least for me, Almost beginning to exceed, and maybe it's age, my capacity to kind of okay. I want to absorb it. I want to get there, but right. but I also think there's something very scary, long, long existential, you know, about where and you know there are I think for the smart people. I don't necessarily agree with everything you say that you know this march towards artificial intelligence. I guess they call singularity when it is so right. Is is kind of that it's kind of like that two thousand one space monolith moment, you know, when something snaps and we turn from you know 
the apes to the people, that it it's a step towards some kind of evolution that I don't know enough about that, but it right. it's a great stuff of science. But it, it, it feels to me like it's kind of creeping up. And I said, just after I really got to like to write. <laughs> <laughs> and, and well, you know, it's it's fair because for one, it is scary. Um, and I think your comment about the pace of change um, is that I've, I've tried to explain this to like my kids or something like a few times we've, we've traveled abroad and we've talked with people and, they're, and everyone's very interested in America, right? It's like you can go to um, Belgium and they'll know what's happening here. And I couldn't tell you like what's happening oh, in Belgium, right? So it's, it's, it's different, the spotlight that's on America that, and just in general than, than most of the world. Um, and it's, it's a big country. And when you're trying to get 320 plus million people of a lot of different backgrounds, I don't even mean just racial, because even just amongst races, right, there's tons of different backgrounds, there's all these different things. When you're trying to get them to make a shift, that understandably needs to take some time. Um, You know, it's not going to happen overnight. And it's every day we're trying to, here's chat GPT, here's this, here's that. <laughs> and it's like social media, I feel like, was unleashed upon us. Like it wasn't like this new thing. It just was unleashed. Um, we had yeah, no idea yeah. what's going to happen with it. And I think it's fair. I mean, it is it's scary to think about what's going what's gonna to happen. I, I, tend to, I tend to be kind of a magical thinker in general, but I'm also... I never like, said that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But I I like to think like I'm kind of ambivalent, right? I'm here and there. Like I contradict myself to fulfill myself half the time. So it's like I'm a magical thinker over here, and then over here I'm like, oh, well, you know what? That's not like pragmatically, it's probably not going to work out so well. Like history has told us, yeah, you just introduced Chappie GPT. We're all going to freak out and think everything's going to change. The whole world's like ending and. And at the end of the day, everything's going to like... Yeah, oh, I like that. I like that. I I need to hang with you more. I need a little bit of that (laughs) morality. I love your magical thinking. I I can hold... (laughs) You got to keep those poles just happening. And there you go. Your magical thinking. That's it. That's actually how I stay sane, is having this bar behind me. So I love it. Look at me. I've got a a ship model and one bottle of Maker's Mark. I love it. What are you currently watching? What are you reading? Sadly, I don't think I've watched a network show in years. Sure. It says something on Netflix. Um, on the plus side, and it's too much. It's too much. Too much. Great content, fabulous content on streaming and game. Um, Yellowstone, I'm addicted to. Um, um, oh, it, it, I'm kind of. I've been in the middle of a move, by the way. It's a new home, so I've been kind of preoccupied. Um, I, I love Turner Classic Movies. Do you have here on your table? Uh, you yeah, know, Turner we, Classic I, I, Oh, Bill. I mean, it's, it, it, uh, it's fabulous. It, it's no commercials. I don't know. It's Turner. Um, and he's got this vault that he bought of these... A lot of really good movies to you know about, but these fantastic in gems, including a uh, film noir, you know, from the 30s, 40s, oh, sure. in black and white. And, and <laughs> uh, I, I, I was at the movies the other night. I guess there's a, a new movie uh, out of uh, Marlowe, you know, Marlowe, but it's going to be in color. And I don't know how you can do. That uh, they call it a film noir. I, I don't. I hope it works. But it, it, it's oh, so I, I'm addicted. To it. Reading, you know, I've been really slow. We've been been kind of building a house, and uh, uh, other than and and, and uh, I'd have to be remiss. Uh, I I have read and reread reciprocity. No oh, very funny. Yeah, you know, some, uh, and boy, if that isn't uh, a, a book to read. So uh, I finished that. That's on my shelf. And uh, here we are. And then I want to go back and, and, uh, and read something that I wrote years ago that I might try to. I don't read as much as I should. 
Sure. How about you? What uh, what 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 do you do? Uh, you know? other, than, other than reading, at least. <laughs> right. Well, you know, what's funny is I I I probably buy three books for every one I read at this stage, um, which is a a somewhat sad state of affairs. But I'm very finicky um to to be kind to myself i'm just a lunatic is the truth of the matter but um i um was about three credits i was three i was not even about i was literally three three classes from uh, graduating college um and i stopped and i think there was a large portion of the reason i stopped was i got so tired of reading what i was told to read and that I felt like it was intruding upon um, this vision of myself I had as a writer. Yeah. That it was like, you need to write these essays. You need to read this. You need to read that. And the one thing I've always been extremely sure of as a writer is that I wanted to do my thing. I wanted to be something unique. I wasn't trying to recreate anyone. You know, I wasn't trying to recreate any of the greats. I wasn't trying to be Hemingway, Joyce. I wasn't trying to be anyone modern. I was, you know, king anyone. I wanted my own voice, my own way of expressing things. Um, I wanted it to work. I want people to be able to connect with it. But I didn't want to recreate. And I felt like school's very much trying to put you in a box. Yeah. And I'm like, I need to recreate a new box. Um, and so sometimes even with reading, I can be that way is that you internalize it, which is the great thing about it. And I, I do love to read. That's why I buy all these books. But I get very selective and I get very quick to put things down. Um, oh, yeah. And so I think the last thing I was reading uh, was, was a great, it was actually a fantasy series by uh, Ken Liu, uh, the Dandelion Dynasty. Um, I'm somewhere in those books. I think I'm on book four over the years that I've gotten through. Um, and that was the last thing I was reading probably halfway through but sometimes it's also pragmatically here it's i you know we have kids i help i help my uh my daughter with our granddaughter i work i host this crazy show um and i need time for my own writing so um it's the juggle match and sometimes it falls out of the juggling i did i did i, I was thinking books because and, and i i i do want to maybe round it out with a couple Probably the most one of the most interesting books I did read. It was about just before I, uh, well, after I kind of put the collection together of my stories, and and was trying to figure out a title because you know in an anthology, you know it, it, it really don't have to have, you just kind of how does it all play out? And as as short story people know. My collection is eclectic, and we know Tim T. Johnson loves the eclectic versus LinkedIn. Uh, but but he gets, we've got to have a, an interesting title. And I said, okay, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff. Well, I picked up a book uh, <laughs> called The End of Everything. <laughs> Astrophysi <laughs> yeah. Astrophysically. Yeah, astrophysically. No, no, no. This is not aimed to impress anybody because it's just, it's not the, I mean, normally, and I'll tell you my other favorite writer in a minute, but it was just intriguing. And, and, and she's a, uh, how to put it, it's it's kind of astrophysics for dummies, but she's, you know, one of the preeminent, uh, Kate uh, Katie Mack, preeminent yeah. astrophysicists, and it was just fascinating. And and it, 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 it I was existentially, what, what is our destiny? I mean, Tim started talking about that in the debut a little bit about our legacy and what have you. And, and she just said, well, look, you know, there are lots of ways things can go. Mm -hmm. Most of them not so good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, mathematical models of what happens in 97 billion years. And uh, but, but buried in there. And then in another book I'd read, I, I can't remember the name of it, it was this whole idea of multiple universes. The you multiverse. Know, the multi, yeah, the multiverse. And and in it, I guess the idea kind of blows my mind. The end it is that every every action has an infinite number of ways it plays out. Sure. And and that and then so that was going through my head. It was fascinating with that. 
it was in the pandemic when everyone was wandering around saying it is what it is, you know. <laughs> it, is what it, is. it is what it is. And then the other thing is, just, well, if it can't go wrong, it will go wrong. And mm-hmm. it all swirled around. And then suddenly I came up with whatever happens probably will. You know? <laughs> Very good. So, so there you are. That's and a beautiful like, way of looking at it. Yeah. You know, have you seen, there's a, a movie about the multiverse. Um, I think it's up for an Oscar. Um, uh, yeah, lost. yeah. It, it was almost everything. indecipherable. Every, everything and you ever was. Everything, just, everywhere, all at once. Yeah. What did you think? Did you watch it? I did, I did. Uh, I we enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it, but it, as I said, I'm a tiny mind. And, and it was so, where are we? I, I you know, I'm the guy that loves reading this. And I, I, was, I, <laughs> right. I, don't know. I, don't, I know what's happening. So the, um, so it's a little behind, yeah, like behind the, uh, the crazy Irish drinker here. Um, my dad um, was a, he has this degree in physics. Oh. Um, and he was okay. an aerospace engineer doing top secret stuff or, or at least secret enough. It was top secret at the end. It was secret before that. And so most of the time I had no idea what, what he was doing. Um, and, uh, but he was really into physics. And so, and he was commuting we were, we were uh, at Palmdale, um, was where I mostly grew up from about seven to, um, we moved where I'm at now. Um, and the one thing you could always engage him because he worked long hours. Um, and uh, and so we didn't get really spend a lot of time with him because he'd come home and be tired and kind of eat and watch Star Trek and go to bed. But if you brought a physics, any random Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat, if I'm even saying that right, there's all these things. Oh, you could get him. You would, you would get oh, a dissertation. Neat. Like you would go in. So, uh, so I always had this kind of like interest in all of that. Uh, I think from a kid, you know, kind of like that was the time I get my dad's attention, right? And so it's like I always like still to this day, I'm like, oh, this came, you know, quantum. You know, I could explain explain to my kids, you know, quantum entanglement and things, right? I'm like, oh, speak yeah, action, yeah. action yeah. at a distance, you know. I'm like, I was like, what's Whoa. that? You know? Yeah. And and we would go, and so it's I knew that theory, um, and it's I forget the physicist, but it's basically is every choice you make, the universe yeah. splinters. Um, um, and so watching it, I was, I knew that's kind of where they were going. So I kind of just intuitively understood it because I knew the background, but I can see you don't, you don't have that background of it. It looks like this utter chaos and so, trying so, to follow along. So I got to ask you two questions. Did, did, he, did he work at the Lockheed Skunk Works? When he retired happen? from Lockheed Skunk Works. Yeah, yeah. So where they yeah. roll the bombers out of. Yeah. yeah. Where they do the bombers out of is, um, and they still live there at 10 minutes at most from the, from the house that we were in. Yeah. Um, so, but that was very close. So he ended his career finally not commuting. Um, up until that, the 30 years he was driving, you know, two hours to work and back. Now he didn't, um, he, he didn't, he didn't take that uh, unmarked plane somewhere and, and flying out to Area 51, <laughs> did he? I mean, yeah, I, he I don't know. know. What, what, what I always tell him is, like, my only thing I can assume is it's back engineering alien spacecraft. Like, that's what I'm positive yeah. he worked on. Not that he ever, government, he never told me that directly, but I pieced it together. There was, yeah. there was definitely aliens. I, that is fascinating. Oh, I'm fascinated. You know, <laughs> I really am. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Right. And the other part of my library, I have models of alien spacecraft. So, oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, if, if the aliens were to come down and you had to educate them on human culture, civilization in general, what do you give them a book? What movie? Like, what, what do you give them? You get one thing. Oh, holy moly. Do I get a, a lifeline phone call for someone on that? There, there's no wrong answers. There's one right there's answer. No wrong there's answer. no wrong I, answers. I, I, <laughs> well, here we go. Let's try this. Um, so presumptively, they are technologically capable and, and so um, I wouldn't guide them towards even the smartest thing we've done. I mean, sure. you know, um, I, I guide them 
to the inner core, humanity's sure. inner core, which, which ties into my my concern with this AI that that it's it's smart, and mm-hmm. and and you know that's what humanity is smart. It's the emotion, you know, okay. and and who knows? And you know, was it Stephen B. Hawking? Don't be sending, you know, these probes out. Is we probably don't want, <laughs> right? Probably, you know. Mm-hmm. We, and maybe you answer this to a degree when we were uh, when you were mentioning climate change. But is there anything that haunts you? Uh yeah, that's a that's a haunt. I, mean, I, I you know, we we we're certainly not my generation. Generation, we were. We were, we were that post World War Two. We were the engine of, you know, look, we were the engine of democracy, but we were the engine of the engine. You know, mm-hmm. that makes sense. And sure. and and um, you know, uh, kind of one of the all time great movies in my junior year in college was The Graduate. The Graduate, sure. and he brought one of the marvelous, great, great. One line when 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 Dustin Hoffman character doesn't know what to do, and one of his dad's friends says, "Plastic, plastic, son. That's the future." <laughs> right. You know, it was. I mean, then, you know, I mean, and think was. about it. And, and I just was watching the news the other day, and and we we're, we're, we're drowning in plastics. I mean, it's like right. so. Yeah, I, I'm haunted um, by that. Uh, I guess existentially. Sure. And you know, we're we're haunted by by regrets, we all are. You know? Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Keep it on the magical thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it, it's funny. Um what I what I think actually haunts me more than anything, and this is way selfish and I'm a horrible yeah. person, but anyone that watches two episodes is gonna understand that pretty quickly. <laughs> You're a good person. <laughs> I think what haunts me the most, um, and I think this has always haunted me, I think this goes back to like preteens maybe, is the thought of unrealized potential. It's that and I and I have this I have this crazy mix of like self-delusion and being incorrigible. And like you can accomplish pretty wild things that way. I mean, hell, Trump probably became president because of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's a few things. Um, you can accomplish great things with that, but it's I've always, always hurt to kill myself over. There's so much more I could do, right? It's that I'm I'm throwing things away, and and so it it drives me, like to do things right, and then. But then it's right. There's all you're juggling family. You're juggling all these things, and like my, you know, my family's number one. Like it, it is the most important thing to me. But that's the thing is, I, I feel like I'm always like that. That's that drive to self realization. That I feel like <laughs> I'm never going to hit the self realization point. That's and also that's what gets me. That's also a, the drive is also part of the creative process. Yeah. I, you know, I think, yeah, for that balance between uh, aspiration, delusion, where we are, and, and you know, a spoiler alert, uh, Bill, uh, it only gets harder when you get old. Sure. You, you know, the, the, the balancing of the account. Right. You know, where do we sit? Tim, in your debut show, you know, kind of talk a little bit about the legacy and the haunt of time. And uh, I'm old. I think I'm twice as old as both of you guys together. But but I, I and I would say that, that when I talk to not just writers, my generation, my great friends, we're haunted by that. Way too heavy. Let's stay magical. You know. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, folks. Can I add a little of my makers to my ginger hair for a minute? Oh, absolutely. Why don't you talk for a second while I reach over to my chip bottle, a little bit of that magic magic potion in. Yeah. I assure your listeners I'm fully clothed from the waist down. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll kind of segue into something. It's one of the things that, that when I describe some of my stories, if I can shamelessly 
market. I think in some work I do something that, that a number of my stories hint and are haunted by things that are at the edge of the page. They're certainly at the margin of the edge of the page. I, 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 I like that as a construct in some of my stories. And I think because it's a universal, sure. you know, I mean, as people, we do it in, in, in characters. It, it, it's sometimes fun to, and it, sometimes you don't even have to, you know, it's like the, the best horror shows. So it's where you don't, you don't ever see the, right. you, know, you don't ever see the thing. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's like Jaws, right? Like famously yeah, they yeah. had the mechanic shark and it didn't work right. Right. And so they had to cut it, and it makes it a classic because you yeah. don't see the shark, and that's that's the real terror of the thing. So that that's that's the thing, right? Is it's always the thing you don't see, right? There's always that shark lurking, and that's pinpointing what the shark is is actually the trick. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. Plus, I've never been in the water since. I live by the ocean now. I don't go near the ocean. You know, <laughs> I do. Honestly. No, Chamber of Commerce, we, you know, we're good here. <laughs> we're good. Um, actually, right, actually so. Bill, Bill, I, was, I was over at my house and said, I think I was just, Bill Nath doesn't have sharks in the water, does it? You know, hello, it's the ocean. You know, we, <laughs> it's not by <laughs> no, the no ocean, you know. <laughs> Anyway, very good. So, is there a trip that um, you've taken that's changing your life? You know, I got thinking about that. Um, I'm going to give you, I'll just give you a couple, you know, if that's one. Um, it was around 1970, summer of 1971, on a whim and a dare. And I decided to solo hitchhike. Through Europe, I mean, okay. no plan. Um, right. Those who may remember that history, it's just been kind of a thing that that popped up. That well, you know, it's funny. I, I just interject briefly. Yeah, please. It, yeah. It's funny. There's lots of people, like especially like in that time frame. It was you go backpack through Europe. Yeah, yeah. That was, no one that ever was... talks about backpacking through America, which is probably smart because yeah. like you will be shot. <laughs> Well, you know, oh yeah, I mean, well, but I was kind of, even then, I had, a, I had a ticket in those days, TWA, I, you could put your ticket, and I, I, I think the airfare was like 80 bucks, you know, I mean, it was crazy, but mm -hmm. I flew from New York to London, I had that ticket, cool. and then stuffed in, the, in my backpack, I had a return trip from, trip from Geneva to Switzerland back to New York. That was the only thing that was paid for. I had a backpack, sleeping bag. I had some clothes. And, and of all the ridiculous things, it would make a fun story. <laughs> you know, I wasn't a hippie or anything. It really was a pretty clean cut. <laughs> it, it, I stuffed a blue blazer in the bottom of my backpack on the theory that I might run into an heiress you know, or a, or a, or a, a lonely princess <laughs> who would invite me to, you know, a more formal dinner than I was going to get at a youth So yeah. what do you think about it? I mean, of course, it never came out of the bottom. It was real. It never came out of the bottom. But yeah, it, it, was, it was great. Um, I, I would travel alone, but then you'd kind of coalesce like amoeba, you know, and then we'd, we'd drift and float. Sure. We'd, and then we'd dissipate and uh, meet some other people and it, it was really a magic it really was I mean it, I mean I wouldn't even I wouldn't even think about doing it. Okay. A child of mine said no I don't care so yeah just go I said well mom you know it's, it, we didn't have cell phones right you know, you know it, where are you going to be son I don't know you know and uh, but it, it was great I guess I guess it was the only time then uh, before or after that, I was completely floating in in just adrift. A mm -hmm. And uh, and it tied into this. I wouldn't recommend people doing that today. But I think the greatest place that I ever found in those travels was Bruges, Belgium. 
you ever want to go to a fabulous uh, maybe Copenhagen you know, which I didn't do drugs sure. it wasn't they were just marvelous places and then the last comment about places to go if you ever want to elope I would recommend getting married on a mountain in Maui Hill. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did. So the rest of my life, I can tell people I got married on a mountain in Maui. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're in the shadow of Las Vegas. So my uh, my <laughs> oldest friend, my, my, my only friend from high school, my dear friend, uh, uh, Robert, him and his wife, um, Claudia, went out to vegas we went out for her birthday um and then they they end up eloping out there around her birthday so every year now we still actually try to get together and this is geez I, i'm sorry i'm forgiving you guys the birthday i love you but 15 yeah. ish a year i mean my wife and i i shouldn't say this because she's over there and i'm blanking in the moment Let's see, my, <laughs> oh. son's, my son's 11 we've been married 12 years i think in august it's going to be 12. Okay, I get, I get confirmation. It's going to be 12 years in, uh, in August. Um, so Robin Claudia is probably... Oh, okay, so it's going to be 13. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm getting corrected. It's going to be 13 years. So Robert, how, okay, so how long have Robert and Claudia been married? Yeah. Is it 20? Yeah, it is. Short story is probably about they're probably close to twenty years, and we still try to get together for uh, for their anniversary slash Claudia's birthday. Did, did, um, did, did they get married at the Elvis Chapel? Or, I mean, oh, oh, it was, no, it, was it was worse. It was worse. Come Elvis on, would have been an come upgrade. on! You can't even say it. <laughs> well, which so, chapel was it? The I do. I, 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 I can't. Chapel or I can't remember, but I I know the lady that was doing the. Um, the wedding coordinator, if you will. I, I'm, being really generous. For- I, I'm being really generous. I'm being really generous with wedding coordinator. She was <laughs> drunk and high out of her mind. <laughs> and she's trying to put the lapels on us. And she's stabbing Robert to death with this like little needle. She's because she can't do it because she has no motor yeah. skills at this point. And then at one point, she keeps like sitting on everyone's lap. You know, she's just sitting on lap. She's sitting on Robert's lap. She's sitting on my lap. And I think she had a lot of beans earlier than that because you did not want her sitting on your lap because there was a fair bit of flagellants like happening. And uh, and so as Claudia's walking down the aisle, she's trying to play the organ. And the organ, I mean, she's kind of hitting the tune. She She's holding it together well enough with that. But every time there's a quiet moment, you just hear her farting. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I got I, I, I may get into trouble saying that. By the way, the Hawaiian Hawaiian Islands are, are absolutely gorgeous, and the people they are marvelous. The, cult, the culture is fantastic. But you know, back in the old sensitivities, when I was kind of an idiot, I didn't know anything. I was, so let's let's go elope, and she made all the arrangements. This little church at the top of a mountain. That, you know, I'm, I can be very insensitive. So anyway, and I said, "Come up, is you know, top up there that we have to like throw a gun in as part of the ceremony? <laughs> is there a sacrifice to the volcano?" Right. But it, was, it, it was a wonderful time. So those right. two things: but go to go to Bruges, if not Copenhagen, and if you, you're inclined uh, to a low, go to Las Vegas. You know. Or a, a <laughs> well, don't go to Las Vegas. So that's just you know, if maybe, you're inclined to a low, when it's you're yeah. close by. That's where you do it. But. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> Which am I happy in? Can I do one other thing? And you can oh, absolutely. You can, I, I I was so interested how, and I think you said it started on your debut show as kind of uh, pre-take, not an outtake. But uh-huh. suddenly, in your dialogue, our buddy Tim reaches over and he he pulls out. The signed Franco Harris football right. helmet. I mean, this guy's magic. I mean, I went crazy. <laughs> and, and, and one of the things that I, one of my other things, if I talk about great, great pleasures, is you got to go to minor league baseball. Right. If you haven't done that, and if you come down to 
to, you don't go to Bruges, you don't elope, you don't go to Copenhagen, come down to Savannah. So, okay. Uh, and go to, well, it's a really a semi-pro baseball club called the Savannah Bananas. <laughs> the Savannah, Savannah Bananas. Bananas. And if you Google it, they are like one of the most successful professional sports fans in the, because every inning, not just the seventh inning, is a contest or game. I mean, they've got to, they go out, they, it, it's like a circus with baseball. Around. Sure. Um, kids get in there and, and it's a reasonable thing. It's a beautiful old kind of stadium. Yeah. This is a pair. Yeah. Kids get in there with a normal size ticket, price ticket. They can have all the hot dogs and Coca-Cola they can drink. Now, they have that two and awesome. they blow up. So it's a, it's, it's a good <laughs> business deal. But, but then, I mean, it's just fabulous. They've got, they've got, you know, cannons that fire off hot dogs. You know, right. into the stadium. they've got, um, they've got a group of senior ladies called the Savannah Banana Bananas. <laughs> And they go out and they do dances. So I mean, if, if Savannah is a wonderful place. Savannah is beautiful. We, we is, just, yeah. because when you fly out there, you end up flying into Savannah. Is the the yeah, nearest? That's right. right. We, we did Charleston once, but you end up. Uh, they used to have direct flights from LAX to Charleston, and so yeah. we would. Um, one year we did direct um, LAX to Charleston, and then did the. I think it's about two and a half hours, if I remember right, to try to get to yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. Hilton Head area, um, and uh, but all the other times we've done Savannah, and uh, yeah, we went, we did the ghost tour because I'm, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a huge nerd. Like you, yeah, you yeah, tell yeah. me, well, Bigfoot or a ghost, you might as well just toss money away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, so listen, so, so I love minor league, minor league baseball. So I'm going to reach over as Tim did. He pulled out the Franco Harris sign. Oh, very I'm good. Let's do this. I'm pulling out for your enjoyment a baseball from the Lansing, Michigan Love Nuts. <laughs> Very cool. I mean, this is what I have. And it says, <laughs> in 2001, I went nuts at Love Nuts. So Very good. I think maybe, maybe we should have a tradition for some of your people to pull something from their sports collection, <laughs> whether it's Franco Harris signed or a, a Lansing Lugnucks minor league baseball ball part of the game. Okay, let me get that in. Awesome. So you know what? I think it's time to transition to the writing part of this yeah. show. Let me read something. I, before we start on the reading, though, uh, maybe give the audience here a second to what book it's from and what you're reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, thank you for pulling it up before. Very Whatever good. happens, Probably will. Um, and, and let me give a couple of thanks. By the way, my this is published by Short Story America. Um, and, and I hope when we close, uh, we can have a minute or two to talk about that extraordinary group and what <clears throat> Tim has done. Tim, uh, as my mentor, my friend, and inspiration, this is what I ended up with. Um, it's 18 stories, eclectic collection. Um, I think I explained a little bit about the existential, whatever happens, probably will. Um, mm -hmm. What, for better or for worse, and it's always up, up to a reader to judge, um, I have tried to, and been inspired by, and tried to do what, what M does in his writing, what Edgar Allan Poe, a uh, good University of Virginia man, did in his it's to create what he what Tim calls that singular effect for the reader, you know that that emotional payback. In other words, if I, as a, a writer, am going to ask the reader to give me his or her time, then I think my obligation is to try and some kind of do that. And again, I try. There sometimes, sometimes I don't. And I guess uh, I hope in this collection. And the story I'm going to read, I think, illustrates that. I try oftentimes to put the power of the story in the last paragraph. But it's become kind of a, a little quirky thing with me. And so um, here we go. Now, the other thing is the story from Whatever Happens Probably Will has a couple of tie ins to our whiskey. It also has a tie in <laughs> to the great. Uh, the great tradition down here in the south of Duke's 
mayonnaise. Duke's mayonnaise. Most greatest. Duke's oven. mayonnaise. Very good. So I'm going to ask you to kind of close your eyes and, and join me along the South Carolina coast, coast the Georgia South Carolina coast, at a uh, at a little little funky uh, crab shack and bar called uh, the uh, Awkward Voice. And it's short, so I'll read it in its entirety. And here it goes. Very good. Dukes. Here's the thing, Devereaux. I didn't hear a punch falling come up behind me. I never do. He is an overripe hulk of a man, a former all conference tackle at Clemson, now tending towards the soft and mushy from the good life at the awkward oyster, our side place known just north of Brunswick along the Georgia coast. It's nothing fancy. Sandwiches, a funky selection of beers, a good crowd of regulars, mostly the local trippers and mill shift workers, international paper. Twice each fall, we put on an oyster roast. It also pulls in the fancier BMW crowd staying over at the cloisters on Sea Island. And Punch, yep, Punch runs around introducing himself as the executive chef. I just let it go. But we nearly lost it all a couple of years ago, whacked by late season storm that slammed nearly headlong into the place. And then we were nearly smothered by a nasty balloon mortgage. Old pilings held, first Carolina coastal refinanced. And we reopened with a new tin roof, some fresh paint, a hint of cash in our pockets, and a Friday night all can you eat rib sides special for twelve ninety nine. The ribs were a hit. And when punched through and blended rye shots for a buck a couple of weeks later, top shelf only, the locals dubbed it Ribs, Rye, and Regrets. Punch jumped on it, plastering the whole thing up in big capital letters on our special board behind the bar, crowning it as a regular Friday night blowout. Yep, business has never been better. Punch certainly has a head full of this. We get along well. He can be. Annoying. First, he always just calls me by my last name, even though I'm married to his cousin and it drives her crazy too. Second, he just appears. His movements defy logic, along with the laws of gravity and the physics of mass. His impressive bulk floating through the air like Goodyear blimp until he drifts in for a moron silently right behind you. And third, he starts just about every conversation with, here's the thing. He was at it again. Here's the thing, Devereaux. I found a half-eaten pastrami sandwich back in the kitchen. Fourth time this week. Hey, some people eat light. He let that go, but he wasn't finished. He never is. And it wasn't made with mustard, but with mayonnaise. Don't you see? Duke's mayonnaise, I'm sure, on white bread, no pickles, started shaking, with lettuce and tomato. Nobody down here makes a pastrami sandwich like that. He paused. Nobody but that new guy, McAllister. Never seen McAllister had come up from somewhere near Macon, not long out of the army and on the drift. He had served a tour in Iraq and was looking for a job. He needed another short order cook, something he had done in the Army, although he didn't really elaborate. He was hardworking, kept to himself, put up with punch. I liked him. Punch didn't. The freaking sandwich looks like a BLT. Punch still wasn't finished. Two days ago, I saw McAllister make, then actually eat, a mayonnaise sandwich, nothing but the mayo and bread. I held back because I'm pretty much addicted to mayonnaise, too. Dukes, of course. Helmets only in a pinch. But Punch, on some frolic and detour a few years back, had worked at a deli in Brooklyn. He returned with some strange Yankee ways, including a curious obsession with golden spicy brown mustard and the movie reviews of The New Yorker, although few of their picks ever made it to the screen at the Highway Dixie drive-in up the road. All right, Punch. I'll talk to him. I'm always amazed. 
What's going on, Mr. Devereaux? Well, I was a little dust up with punch this afternoon, I shrugged. You do know most folks around here like a pastrami sandwich made with mustard, mustard, right? I smiled just to let him know I was the good guy here. Look, I'm kind of a mayonnaise guy, mostly on a BLT. Dukes, he said. I nodded. Jefferson paused. Sir, can I tell you a story? Yeah, sure. In Iraq, I bunked next to a tough, a tough purple named Mullins. Just turned 20. He was a country boy from Georgia, too. His mom sent him a couple jars of Dukes every month, and we would heap gobs of stuff on everything. On hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, we even mixed it into our spaghetti, but just once. He smiled. But it wasn't really about the mayonnaise, you know. It was all about home. It could have been mustard. It could have been sweet tea, almost anything else. Cost again. But Mullins, well, he loved it on a pastrami sandwich, on white bread. Jefferson slowed. He was about halfway through one when the lieutenant pulled him for a quick peek on mission. Kind of routine, no big deal. He asked me to wrap that sandwich up for him and hold it for when he came back. Jefferson looked in there. You see, Mr. Devereaux, my friend there. I didn't know what to say. So I said nothing. He continued. Now, every day I can, I make a pastrami. I go heavy on the mayo and load it up with all the other stuff we didn't always have. I only eat half, and I leave the other half for my friend. Just in case. Jefferson's own spoke. I know that's kind of, he said no more. He turned away and back to me. This is something I have. That is yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And that, that, I, 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 that, that story brought me to the dance. You know, I, I wrote that in, I wrote that in 2019, just as my grandson was headed over. Uh, and uh, um, I don't think pun. The All Magazine, which is a great little magazine out of Oxford, Mississippi, uh, named that a best of 2019. So, again, we love affirmation. Um, some days you eat the bear, sometimes the bear eats you, but that <laughs> seemed to, to hit some nerves. And uh, I, I would actually say that was when I shared that with Tim and and worked on it, that's when we, we thought we would have a go together. But again, I hope it, I, I believe, I think that does hit singular emotion. I think, uh, I think it's a it's punch in the head. For sure, it's really beautiful. Hang on, I'm was sure there there's anything, because um, you had mentioned you were in the, uh, it was the Navy, right, you mentioned earlier. Um, <laughs> And and you you mentioned also that your grandson had gone um, away. What what branch of the military was your grandson in? Uh, the North Carolina National Guard. But uh, those National guys, Guard, okay. yeah, they they uh, well, they, increasingly over over the years, the, the National Guards have really assumed uh, an essential, if not, I won't say common, but they're they're deployed as often as as regular. I don't know. Right. Oh sure, and that, and that's and that's fine. I, I was just wondering, and, and the reason I was asking is I was wondering if, um, with that story, was there? I, I can see the inspiration in, in the general sense with that, but was there anything from your life or just experience that kind of made you that kind of inspired that, or was that fully just from the imagination? Or? Well, you know, um, but. Full reveal. Um, that was maybe the second or third story I had ever written, and I'm getting ready to do a, a book next week. And, and I know one of the things they want to know is is 
where where do your stories come from? Now, you know, when, when the not exactly rocket scientists one and two, that's an easy answer because that's uh, <laughs> stories. You know, I mean, they're just they, they come here and and they're gen they generally kind of come out largely intact in truth. Um, I I honestly don't have great imagination. I, I don't think so. Uh, in g- getting ready to talk to them, I kind of I even have a note somewhere. It seems to me that my stories, and this answering your question, they can be triggered, if not inspired, sure. by a place, you know, uh, an object, you know, and then I'll find around the house or out there, um, observing people. Um, you know, those are pretty obvious. I mean, for me, sure. it's breathtaking. I'm sure writers sure. Mm-hmm. all the time. Um, sometimes, Maybe a lot of times, event or or something surround you know, the war, um, right? That, um, you know, um, uh, and sometimes, and that's kind of the higher order of inspiration, yeah. right? Right. Our true confessions, and I, I, sometimes I get inspiration, and we've all done it. Uh, not a novelist, but but the, the world is full. Of people looking for content, literary magazines, you know, right. uh, that they 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 suddenly get interested in in seeing and publishing uh, a story about something. So you'll think about <laughs> it. You know, right. please, please. I, I often wonder what we even mean by content because you'll hear yeah, like, yeah, "Oh, yeah. my content," and it's just like a picture of them eating. I'm like, yeah, is that exactly. really content? Like, this I, is good. so so that's how kind of the the in in inside part of this is. There was a, 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 a you write about, I Googled and I said, someone wanted uh, to do, submit a story about a pastrami sandwich. Now, you know, so where does it, so there's, you know, my grandson heading there, pastrami sandwich, Duke's, it just, I was making a Duke sandwich, so it kind of, kind of came together. So, you know, nothing really heavier, it just, uh, there it was. But I think it has a message, and that's it. These kids pay a, a heavy burden, and we ask them to pay a lot. Okay. For sure, for sure, and that you know, and that's why I would ask. That's that's really funny. Is not the right word. We I, we use funny in, in myriad ways now, but there's some irony in the fact that you served, your grandson served, and then you write that story, and then the the motivation, the inspiration is is kind of around. Hey, write a story about Dukes. <laughs> like, yeah. is like, I mean, and you can connect the dots, but this is kind of yeah, funny yeah. to think of. It's, it's, part, it's part of that magical thinking. Sometimes those dots, <laughs> yeah, all over the place. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, well, I think you and many of our our writer friends that I know here and, and short story American just have such a such a fabulous sense of imagination when those things come. I struggle with that. You know, I guess. I guess once I get something going, I feel I've got some ability to make an articulate. But boy, you know, sometimes I have to go and look. Who's interested in a story now about a pastrami sandwich? You know, does that answer your question? I mean, it's it, it, boy, that's kind of that's true. It's kind of revealing, uh, you know, cool secrets. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what I like about this show. I always like to like. That's why I'll point out. And I'll point out now, in case you know people hear this on the thing, is my son is now feeding the dogs. So if you hear <laughs> random, it's because like we have two chocolate labs and they're ready to be fed. And he feels miserable. He's eleven, but he feels miserable if like they're he's late feeding them. So he's feeding the dogs now. So if anyone hears that, the dogs are being fed for PETA. Like we we feed our dogs. It's 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 good. Um, but so how would you describe in general your writing process? Um, you know, people describe it multiple ways, so you don't have to get into the first draft, second draft necessarily. But, um, would you say you're like more of an architect? You know, sometimes people say that, oh, architect, the gardener, this or that. Like, how, how would you describe it more in the general terms? Well, that's a, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, moving back into it, I, I, I I do know this because I write, I have the attention span of a gerbil. I mean, <laughs> I think a novel, 
is out of the question. I mean, I, I don't know sure. how people do that. Short stories, you know. And when the idea comes, um, I just write it. I don't, and it's, why outline a short story? You know, it, 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 by the time you outline a short story, you kind of take them the fun out of it. I mean, when I say short stories, when you look at my book, they're two, three, four, six, seven, ten. And that's short. So I just dive in and hope for the best. Curiously, when I was in my day job uh, before this, I, I never used the word, or barely used the word. I, I, there were folks out there, uh, people called assistants and secretaries that helped you longhand, you know, legal thing. Write it out, and magically someone would give you a draft back, and you play with that. So when I started writing, the, the biggest, probably the biggest thing that helped me out is someone forced me to try Word. I, I, I think I'm still on like Windows two. I don't know, but I mean, you know, sure. that that honestly process enabled me to do what I do, which you really can't do when you're longhand. Is write and kind of edit as I go along. You know. To do it and cross it out. That was not a skill I brought to the table. It just kind of popped up. There was technology. Okay. So, so that's that's it. I write. It just kind of goes. No outline. Just no outline. Sure. I, I'm always so. I, I'm always curious when I when I go to talk. How even with novelists or larger writers, it seemed to be like a 50-50 split on people who do outlines and people don't, and equally devastatingly beautiful work. Um, you, you know, and, and it's just remarkable in the end product, something because I have now and others, others uh, just well, prefer. I think, I think so much of life in general is finding the process that works for the <laughs> way your brain works. Um, and I, so I tend to think of myself as a sculptor. Is yeah, that I don't, I don't outline. But there is, there's clay or wood or marble, right? There's a there's something I'm working with, and that wood or that marble, it might be the idea, it might be some character. There's there's and there's a concept there that I already have, and I start chiseling away, and it has, you know, like if you're trying to chisel wood, there's yeah. a character to the wood, yeah. right? And that character might be theme, it might be kind of what I'm working with, but. I'm trying to find that character at all times. So it's, it's, I don't feel like there's muses speaking to me necessarily. I feel like there's something I'm trying to chisel away at. Like I'm, I'm unearthing something as I, I go. love that. Yeah. I, 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 I guess I would say I'm probably more of a sculptor. Yeah, sure. I love that. Love that. You know, a, lot times, <laughs> a lot of times I chisel and I chisel right through the thing. You're right? right? Yeah. Oh, yeah just, that's how oh, I that, feel. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to call myself a sculptor. <laughs> I saw well, my man. If I'm ever asked, you that mean question, both, Mac. Yeah, well, I'm in good company. I mean, I love that that concept. I really do. Hey, yeah. Hey, listen. Cheers. Yeah, I'm serious. So, um, so in general, um, there's a relationship, right, with writer and reader. Yeah. And um, people come about that for different reasons, right? You come about it because you just want to entertain. You just want to, you know, you just want to tell a story. You want to, um, some people want to like change the world through their writing, right? All, all, all these different myriad reasons. And it can change, I'm sure, from story to story or work from yeah. work. But how would, so not so much what your relationship is, because I don't think we're in control of what our relationship is with the reader, but what is, the relationship you're trying to foster with your readers? Um, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm going to talk and I don't walk and chew gum. I want to read something, if I can, from a rocket scientist, too, that talks Absolutely. a little bit about why, why we write. And, and I'm, as I fumble to find it, um, I, I will say I, pro I write, I found out I enjoy it. Um, maybe goes goes back to your question. I don't know whether I accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish. You know, I think I was uh, uh, an ethical and, and reasonably competent, but I wasn't you know, a great. I, 
I did a useful job teaching, but I guess as I, it's, I wanted to leave. And I, yeah. I, I have, you have to, we all go, you know, and I don't, right. there's nothing that I find more satisfying than, than scooting out there and actually seeing stories in, in Western America, you know, mm-hmm. all of us that have done that, the hundreds of, that is the first time that happened was, was just, Lifted my step. <laughs> now two books, and I'm not exactly rocket scientist. Too was uh, taking our group from uh, high school graduation to law school, and I had to kind of wrap up the first one, which ended about a week before graduate. And I grew up in Jersey. It was a high school, and we we did what what kids do in New Jersey. We all kind of went down to the Jersey Shore, you know. After the prom, and um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read this. It won't be long, but I think it answers precisely that question. And it goes: After the prom, a bunch of us drove down the Jersey Shore to watch the sunrise. That night, as we all sat on the beach of a friend's house in Manilowki, on scratchy old blankets in a ragged circle around a small driftwood campfire, even the least poetic of us could feel the tug of things unknown the bubble of our youth already beginning to pop. We knew that we would have to soon pay attention to the wizard behind the curtain, but not just yet. It was a night of breathtaking beauty, about a billion stars up in the sky in a show most people in New Jersey never delivers. New Jersey does, and it did for us that night, just as it had for us so many times. Soft sand, sand tickled our toes, and the taste of salt floated in the gentle breeze. The man behind the curtain could wait one more night. Some moments in every life that are hard to beat, and this was one. Throughout the night, we shared some of the stories you've already read, Rocket Scientist One. Other stories were sweetly private then and must remain that way. That's always a curious balance, and from time to time, you're asked why we write, and more importantly, why we write about real stuff. Maybe it's as simple as wanting, as simple as needing to scratch something in the sand, far from the high water mark, something that says, I will do it. Perhaps all that's what we were doing that night, story shared and storied away, each of us aware that we were already leaving the town of our youth. The muffled sound of the low rollers of the surf, it was indifferent to us then and those who have come before, and those who will come later, we could feel at least something what Lily Tomlin said. We're all in this alone. But that night, we were not alone. We like to think we figured that friendship was a buffer in something. I was here. And so, yeah, uh, this is the introduction of all three of us. Uh, I wrote it for that book. That's as good a, uh, an explanation. What's beautiful about it is that certain people say, and, and it varies, right? All caveats aside. Some people say writing is an uh, immortality quest, right? We're trying to leave something behind. Um, and I think I, there's absolutely truth to that. I think for everyone, there's some degree of truth to that. Yeah. Um, and and it, it probably varies from, from person to person. But um I loved the the uh, metaphor there of writing it in the sand, because even if you write it in stone, even you, wherever you write it, there is a bit that is written in the sand. Like, you know, cave paintings, right? They didn't know you would find it all these years later. And how many cave paintings were never found, right? How many oh, stone yeah. etchings were never found? So it's it's... A beautiful way to think of it is that all of this is writing in the sand. You know, you know, and it thought just occurred to me. Yeah, I mean, so so that was about, I still do that. And here's just this um, Manilokin, that beach where we had those moments. That's gone. Hurricane Sandy literally wow. took, you know, so I guess we try. Sure. <clears throat> right. right. We try to write. <clears throat> you know, stones crumbled, sand sure. washed 
play. Right. You know, so maybe maybe we we what what did what did fix it's, it's all the physical Fitz Gerald say we, we beat it against the current born thesis on the end of the pan. One more writing on the uh one more question on the writing here and then we'll uh We'll transition over to the uh, I'd like to call it the last call because we have to keep yeah, we have yeah. to keep it bar themed. But um, do you write for a particular reader? Like, so I know some writers are like, you know, I write it. My wife is my ideal reader or, you know, X and X. So, like, do you have an ideal reader or is it write for yourself? I mean, there's no wrong answer. I'm just. Yeah, I, I, I would say the first book co-written. We, we, we clearly wrote for a generation, maybe more. Sure. We, we kind of wrote for our buddies because we knew <laughs> we, could, we could strong arm them to buy the book. You know? <laughs> and right. and, and we, we, wrote, we wrote that as an ode to friendship, you know? Right. I mean, you know. And then sure. we, and then honestly, you know, probably more than my, I don't know, my other two writers on that. I just got hooked into the, maybe I want a little more. So I'm going to be you. Huh? Right. So yeah. when, when, as I said, I, I said, let's go out and, and I hooked up with those workshops. And then I said, hey, wait a minute. Um, I, I'd like to claw my way up somewhere up, up the food chain. Okay. So I'm not just remembered, you know, on that shelf. Over there, right. it's wonderful when I come down in the morning, but maybe sometimes. So that's, um, I think that's an important, an important part of it. Um, so I wrote, I wrote those for that. Then when I wrote my fiction, um, I, I try to make it kind of unisex, I guess. I mean, I, 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 I think it's, I think it. There's stories in that collection that that would have. That there's kind of a Nicholas Sparks. Sorry, you may remember one of them. I mean, that's sure. kind of sappy, and and uh, you know maybe more of that kind of on the romance side. And then there's you know some tough tough love, and so I, I tried to make that you know uh, hopefully appealable to a wider audience. I also know I'm told frequently that those of us who write short stories, we're we're really pushing a rock uphill, them you know, <laughs> you know right. you're trying to. It's just not the, the the genre that that makes money. I mean, I, I I'd say well, about, that, that I, that's I, absolutely I, true. The flip side of that is a lot of short stories get made into movies, and that's yeah. actually where the money. Well, is. Well, you, you you talked about that before. We didn't really pursue that content, and mm -hmm. and in, in writing these short stories, I mean, let's be honest. I remember we we had an agent on on the, on the first one. He kept saying, "Hey, do you think you know?" And now that Tony Dow who played Wally Cleaver reports the book. You know, isn't Tony and Tommy done? Maybe he could. Well, yeah. Um, it, one in a million chance, but that does happen. So don't sure. don't think we didn't have that kind of kind of in our in, in our mind. Yeah. But but you know, I had to laugh. You talk about at least once a week. I'll have a, I'll have a, a, a great time. And Bill, this is this makes all the lonely time on a blank piece of paper absolutely. <laughs> Uh, our short story American Conference. Absolutely. Fair. We we get energy. We get don't we? Don't mm -hmm. we get it? Absolutely. Um you know, but I remember I was fired up to it, very honestly. This is gonna be <laughs> and it has been, been wonderful. And I said to Lynn, I said, you know, I wish my wife went, I said, I wish I had gotten to this world. regrets 30 years ago. You know, yeah. God, I love it. She kind of looked away and she looked around our house. And said, you know, I'm kind of glad she did. <laughs> really got use to getting a couple of square meals a day and having a roof right. and all those years. So it's got to be more, it, it's got to be self actualization. We're trying to tie some of those great things you said. Uh, maybe there's more fulfillment in writing sure. and, and leaving, giving something. If you, if you, Give someone some pleasure or some emotional Edgar Allan Poe, teenage emotional so the singular Take emotion. them out of that day. Get yeah. them somewhere else. And okay, you've done yeah. something. You've done something. For sure. A lot more For fun sure. than the binary world of law. Particularly trial. <laughs> yeah. Winner, loser, winner, loser. Right. Well, and you know what's beautiful about it? I, 
I think about it. Um, me and uh, uh, Matthew Kaye, who's oh, what a great, great. I just met him. First yeah, time. right. Yeah, so, I'm a uh, fan. Oh, absolutely. Um, fabulous, fabulous oh, yeah, writer. Um, great, great guy. Great guy. guy. Even more oh. importantly, but fabulous writer. We were talking about it one day, and I remember, you know, I kind of thought about it afterwards. And I was like, you know what I really want out of my writing is a journey. Is that for me, because I because I don't script it, I don't do the architecture, I don't have a, you know, this is where it's going, A to Z. It's always a journey. And I want the reader to come along with me. So it's like, I want to get you as a reader to invest in it. it just as much as I am, because I've already invested. Now I'm hoping to get you invested. And I want us to go on a journey together. And as I'm writing that, I don't know where we're going exactly. But we're going to find out together, and it's yeah. going to be something meaningful. Hopefully, maybe just funny. Maybe it, you know, maybe you know, it changes our heart. Like whatever it might be, we don't know where it's taking us, but we're going to go on this journey together. Um, and that's kind of the the path that I make with the reader. That's what what I think about as I'm doing it. It's just like, okay, this is just a journey. Where that's a, where that's, are we that's going a noble. Today? That's a noble path. I mean, that's a, that's a great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's fun. It gets me back. It gets me back here every day. Yeah. And plus, I, I and I like to drink, so it gets me gets me back to the show. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, hey, can we sign up tomorrow? I mean, this is great. Oh, okay. Awesome. So we have hit the point of the night where we have to call last call. You know, you oh, okay. you don't have to leave, but you can't stay here. Although I guess you can rewatch the video and whatever the kids call it, like subscribing, you know, sharing it with their friends, whatever, whatever YouTuber he wants to do. Um, I love this question actually, maybe more than um, more than all the others. Um, cause I take something from all of it. I, I try to learn from everyone that comes on here. I watch these back and try to learn from myself, but, um, if you have a life hack, right. It doesn't have to be a life hack. I, I don't always love the term hack. I'm going to do yeah, my, yeah. my aggressive air quotes here. Um, but if you could share with our, with our, uh, watchers, listener, whoever our audience here. One thing that they could take away, and it could be more than one thing, but they can take away and implement in their lives that make things five percent, you know, better, whatever it might be. What what would you share with them? Okay, yeah, I just context. I, I back is is a new kind of a new term for me. Back when, when I was the stories of my youth, hacking was goofing off. <laughs> no, did you, did, did, no, that's sure. a generational thing. If you, were a, if you were a hacker, and you, you know, you were really? well, and it was like was internet hacking, hacking is hacking bad, was right? It, was get to a it, was, mm -hmm. it wasn't evil, but it was it was a kind of stupid stuff, you know, sure. that's going to earn your, you know, detention and that. <laughs> and if you were called a right. hacker, you know, it, it wasn't like you know, and actually, some of the really fun fun people would hack. You know, so anyway, okay, okay. so I got, okay, hack. So hack is like, it, what what advice? So it would just be advice, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's funny, too, because there's certain terms, um, what, let's see, as of this recording, I'm 44, do I turn 44 this year? No, I'm 45 this year, so I'm 44. Um when I was growing up, it was like you were an internet hacker, right? Like that yeah. was a bad thing. And that was the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or or when I was like I played high school football and stuff, hustle was awesome. Like you were oh, hustling. Yeah. And now yeah. it's like, oh, you're hustling. And now people are like, no, you're like trying to swindle them. I'm like, no, that's <laughs> hustle. Like you you got sideline to sideline. Like you're you're playing hard. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Words change. But yeah, no, just life advice. Like I just, you know, you you've lived. From our conversation, right? Like you've lived a really remarkable life. Um, you're really smart. I, I, I've adored our time together. I don't know. I, and, and maybe nowadays you're allowed. I don't know if guys are supposed to say like I adore my time with you or not. But I have adored this time with you. This has been really, really great for me. But, let me. I really want to answer your question because I've never been asked that. And, and you have to start somewhere. And I, 
I, I, I was I I, I guess I'm not trying to. We're, we're unpacking in a new home, and years and years ago, I, I we all have bumps, you know. And uh, my mom and dad were still. Uh, and they sent me a letter, you know, and I hang in there. And uh, it, it, it closed, and I, I cut it out, and I have it in a little frame somewhere. You know, I'll find it. And it was, um, life is a struggle. To survive with grace, it's class and humor. And, and I kind of like that enough to, right. to frame it. Now, I wouldn't really call that a hack, but it's just something that I've been I got a spot for it up here when sure. I find it because that to right. me was, but, but I guess the other thing I'm increasingly convinced and, and I suspect Bill it's from writing. I, I believe I've become a better person. I think sure. I've become more, more aware of, of, of the fullness of, of what we all go through. Right. And, and so I guess I would just say, you know, just everyone be aware that, that everybody that you, you know and you love and, and those that you don't, people you walk by, we all have a struggle somewhere. Right. Past, present, future. Um, you know, it's like the, the, the iceberg. You know, I mean, what you see, uh, even with people who say what you see is what you get, that's never completely true. Yep, so, sure. you know, I, I fail all the time uh, to try to be sure. you know, better and kinder, but I do I do try to, to remember that, you know, yeah, even when I'm getting mad at customer service, you know, <laughs> um, you know they've got their, you know, I don't know, maybe they don't want to be at that end of the health more than I want to be, you know. And, and it's a, life can be a struggle out here. So I guess the hack is, just remember that, it's, there's something bubbling and going on with everyone. Hmm. And I try to remind myself to do better and understand that. And I fail a lot. I think mean, we all do. Sure. Maybe that's somewhere between hacking, hacking, or hack. I don't know what it is. But and anyway, I had a caveat. No one should ever pay any attention. No one ever does. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, and it's, it's a point we seem to have forgotten in a lot of ways. Like yeah. as a society, we we tend to, yeah. You've sent a tweet that we didn't like, and we're oh, very upset. Okay. And it's you. I, I think in, I'm sorry. Go go ahead. I, I I think in your, I think in in, in in the show that I watched, I didn't you say that you were not a huge fan of a lot of social media. Oh, I hate it. I have okay. no interest. In I mean, that. I I tolerate. And by the way, to anyone who I know. I'm a mess on Facebook. I, I, I'm sure I, <laughs> I unfriend people I want to friend. I'm friendly with people I don't know. I post things. I send them to the moon. People. No. I, I, I saw a, a review that someone wrote in May. And I, I don't know how I came across it. And right. They're probably out there somewhere saying, that son of a gun. So I had to, you know, I, I, it is such a mystery to me. You know. Sure. And, and then tonight, I mean, this is there was a terrible story about sure. that. A uh, young 14 year old up in New Jersey who was, well, you saw it. She was bullied and someone videoed it, and splashed it all over Jeez. the internet, and she uh, she couldn't see herself. I mean, I I hate it. I I, right. I don't know how we're going to put the the genie back in there. On the other hand, you know, I, I try to fumble through a Facebook and try to answer people on, on social media. We get in silos. I, I just think right. so. I'm with you on. Well, I I think uh, about it a lot. And there there was another show we we've talked about this, but I, I truly think the net gain of social media, like if we just looked at it and said society was here before, or did we go up or down? I think we've gone down. I actually think oh, social I media is. I, I think negative. it's a net negative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Can I go back to. to Talking about that great place to have lunch. When you come down and visit, we'll go over there. But people sitting there on their phones in their silos and they're right. you know deep deep in the silo, right. you know. Well, and and it, it you know it's it's multifaceted. Um, and and you know we could go over this for twenty different shows, yeah. but yeah. um, 
part of it is then you get this algorithm that's based on just keeping yeah. you there. Yeah. And but it that starts to silo you. So it's yeah. like um I and this show will be on YouTube, right? Which is the yeah. the yeah. biggest social media platform there is. Um I don't do much on it. I go on long enough. I, I this show to me, this is a labor of fun. Right. So I've it's been delightful talking to you. Everyone I've had on the show, I've had just a fabulous time and I've learned and I've grown and I've had laughs and it's been fabulous. Um, and I'm hoping to share that with people. So it's, it's more like a show. It's just on a alternate platform from yeah. what yeah. I grew up with. Um, and I go on Facebook or whatever long enough just to promote it just long enough just to put it out in, in case people find it and it can well, I love it. it. I love, I love that you're doing it. Yeah. I, but you know, but I, I, the going on for the echo chamber and all of that, that's, yeah. I think it's detrimental. I think it makes, everyone seems miserable. Like yeah. the fact that you go on to like troll someone, like it's a, it's a sad state of psychology. Like I feel bad for those people. Like I never think in my day, I want to make that person miserable. No. <laughs> like, even I mean, for a second, I, I want to make their day a little worse. Oh, it's, wow. it, it, it's extraordinary. You know, I, I I don't want to run out of time before, you know, really saying thank you. Um, for those people who don't write, or those people who write in the comfort of the executive suite at Simon & Schuster, um, you know, our world of kind of, um, in my case, writers writ small, you know, trying to, to do something um, we don't have a marketing, you know, right. powerhouse like this. And, and, and efforts like yours and um, a host of others are so important to us. They give us that, that sense. And, and this is wonderful. I could, I'm not going to have another drink. I know that. <laughs> but uh, thank you for what you're doing. And, and uh, I can't wait to. Oh, beaming in, I don't know, zooming in, and, and, and <laughs> right. but I really mean that. And, uh, um, that's been a delight. I, I, mean, I hope, I hope we have something of interest for you. And very well, it was it was awesome. So I'm honored, Mac. Thank you so much for for coming on, and um, we will be in touch. So, and yeah. everyone, thanks for thanks for joining for the show. That's terrific, terrific. Uh, and don't forget to go out and buy my book. 